Judith Bryles, and with me is Brian Judd. And as you know, Brian is an author of several books uh, and has a phenomenal expertise in niche marketing and how to sell your books outside of a bookstore and in the venues that you never thought about. And he's going to be in Colorado on the 21st for an all-day Maverick book marketing event that's sponsored by Author U. So those of you who are listening in who have signed up, we'll look forward to seeing you. If you haven't and you can get here, that would be terrific. Um, I, I know from How to Make Real Money Selling Books and his other excellent book, uh, Beyond the Bookstore, is uh, I've known people who have taken just a few pages out of those and made a mini book empire in revenue. So we'll get into that. And what we thought we'd do is we'd start off today with a 15 minute, um, just a mini webinar on some ideas to do. And then we're going to open the mics up. So write down your questions. And, and then we can start answering them. And we'll unmute you as you go along. You're going to be on mute right now while Brian talks. And then we will start asking questions. And so when we see you raise your hand, you'll see that on your uh, site here. Just click on the uh, that you have a question. And then we will come to you as, as we have it and answer them, which I'm sure will trigger other questions. And then we've actually had some people email some questions in that are going to be listening to this later. And then at the end, we're going to give you a special offer. Um, for those of you who do sign up, you're going to get something at w worth uh, $25 in a nanosecond. But with that, let's bring Brian on. Hi, Brian. How are you this afternoon? Very good, thank you. How are you? I'm great. Good. It's great. It's a snowy afternoon in Colorado. Oh, it's a, actually a warm afternoon in Connecticut, or early evening. Oh, you know how to make a girl feel bad. OK, so. <laughs> well, if that's heading our direction, we'll have it soon. There, there you go. But Brian, Brian is, as you can see on the slide, he's, he's written 19 books. Um, four of his titles are very specifically towards marketing strategy and planning, um, dealing with books. He's got a spectacular newsletter that I would really recommend that you all sign up for, the Book Marketing Matters that comes out. Um, he's a book marketing consultant, he, and he, he brings what he brings to the party is uh, over multi years expertise as a marketing manager for one of the Fortune 500 companies and how they grew and expanded under his guidance. And he's also the, the founder and creator of a commission-based sales to non-store book buyers. So here we are. And Brian, I'm going to turn it over to you. Great. Well, thank you very much. And thank you all for joining us this evening. We have a good uh, a good sized crowd for this type of a, of a uh, venue where we can have some questions and Q&As. As Judith mentioned, I'll just do a brief webinar, about 15 minutes or so, just to get things started. What, the topic of this will be how to get a fast start in 2012. That's my objective tonight, to help you do that. And uh, then we'll open it up to the Q&A. So we'll just we'll talk a little bit about this. But some of the basics, I think, just for basic marketing is have a quality product. I think good promotion will kill a bad product very quickly. So you've got to have a good book that's based on a, a customer need, that's edited, that's produced properly. And it's, it's something that you have to have your commitment behind it. And this idea of a success group is something that I've started out. No, I didn't start, but I am a member of this. We About five of us meet every every other month. And we talk about our businesses. Not uh, we, we bring questions there and topics and information. And we have the other people who just give us insight into the business. So that's a, a, a fun way. And just as I will be hitting some of these fairly briefly. And if you have other questions we can talk about, if you want me to go in more in depth, you can ask that question. I'll hit that later. But one thing that I always talk about is to have a plan. And if, even if it's a very brief plan that's platform based, it doesn't have to be the conventional uh, objective, strategies, tactics, plan, all that is good. I'm not, but the, if you have a platform based plan that's easy to use. That, that's the key is that it should be functional, something that you'll that you'll uh, go to regularly instead of just putting it in the in the file cabinet and picking it up next December 31st to see if you reach your objectives. So just do a very brief plan. Just do something that will keep you going in the right direction. This is key. Some of you have seen me do other webinars. I bring this topic up probably every webinar just to 
start to define who your target buyers are. It's so important that you don't have to have an exact figure of, uh, of women aged 51 to 62 or something like that. It's not, not the point. But the, the idea is that if you know you have a very a little higher economic uh, demographic, well, then you're probably not going to go to Walmart to sell your books. Or on the opposite side, if you have something that would be appropriate for a different demographic, you might go to Target, not going to a, a Neiman Marcus. So just if you have a good feeling about who they are, this is a great question to ask. Who else could be a prospect? I started out in 1990 selling a, a, my job search book, a book about how to get jobs, obviously. And a couple of years, I, I started selling them in bookstores. And then a couple of years later, I got a call from a prison librarian who said, I'd like to buy my book. And I said, why? <laughs> but it's, you know, prisoners get out of prison who want to make sure that they're trained to get a job. And I never would have thought of that. So I contacted other people, and I, uh, I wrote, there was a very little job search information for the Hispanic marketplace, so I had the book translated into Spanish. So if you just keep asking that question, who else, who else, I think you'll find that very, very productive. Where do they shop? Well, maybe it's not in bookstores. Maybe it is in, in Walmart, or maybe, they, or maybe they travel a lot, and they're going to uh, airport stores or supermarkets, or maybe they just congregate in associations or PTA meetings. If you know that, then that's where your books need to be available, wherever your your target reader is. So know who they are, where they are, when they are, when they buy. Just like uh, a job search book for the college market is fairly seasonal. Every year, the 1.5 new college graduates coming into the marketplace. So it's a the, the traditional um, job search market is not seasonal, but seasonal, but part of it is. So if I know when I know that, I know when to time my promotion to meet that need. So then organize these buyers into, into groups, into market segments or you know, mini markets. When I, when I talk about segmentation, I can almost see that the, the eyes glass gloss over it. But if you just think about uh, similar groups or groups of people who buy for similar reasons. So when you contact, this is for a business book. If you have a, a, a book you're selling to office supply stores, well, they'll buy for reasons different from the corporate buyers. So you have to know if you can organize these people and, and you prioritize your leads and you find the names of buyers in each of these areas and you start contacting them, you, you contact them for the right reasons, for their reasons for buying. So I really, I really suggest that you take the time to organize your buyers into these types of groups. You'll find it a lot more productive. Now, just briefly hit the the four P's of marketing. Every plan has the four P's: the product, place, price, promotion. And just to organize your thinking a little bit here, the um, well, sorry, the, the part of the promotion, but this is, uh, let's skip over one of these. This is still part of your preparation of building your platform that is probably the fifth P, product, place, price, uh, promotion, and platform. But I think that some, many, some people think I have to get a, a whole bunch of people following me on Twitter or friends on, on uh, Facebook. It's not necessarily the case. If you can find the messengers, the people who are centers of influence, who are professional uh, executives or uh, um, affiliate marketers or people that can spread the word for you to their groups. I think if you have this two-tiered, two-leveled platform that you get the quality of people, these messengers and mobs, <laughs> I'm trying to think of an M word for, for lots of people, but if you can, then you have these people. But if you reach this messenger, it's a real key to getting your message to these people. So I think that if you look at your platform as a two-level basis that you can uh, really come up with a, a more successful use of your, your contacts. So now the product, <coughs> excuse me, the, uh, the, the four groups, they have seen this as far as market growth and market share, but I've changed this to uh, more of a, of a usable format where you have your front list and back list. Instead of looking at your books as a front list and a back list, Look at those as, what are your star books? What are those that have high growth and high profit? And those are the ones that you really want to market. You may have your cash cow, the evergreen titles that just keep plugging along your mid-list. Those are, are those you, you can keep your promotion going to. But here, you, this is the one, this, these titles are the ones, whether they're front list or back list, those are the ones you really want to, to promote and to put your promotional dollars into those. 
those that have slow growth, whether it's in profit or in sales or market share, well, those are the ones that you can bury, you can get rid of, you can take out of print, so they're not using up your, your mind space. And these questionable ones, well, maybe that they're, they have uh, a seasonal effort, or maybe that they need a little bit of change in the production of it, so that it makes it a, a star. But just evaluate your product line. Instead of thinking front list and back list, think about the, 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 the contribution that the book, the title makes to your overall growth and, and market share. Some pricing strategies. A lot of people will say, well, when they're pricing a book, is they'll go to, the, to Amazon and look at their competition and price it the same as competition. Well, I, I suggest not doing that because, as you know, the, the more books you print, the lower your unit cost. So you may have a competitor priced at $14.95, and they print 10,000 books at a time, and their printing cost is 75 cents. But if you print 500 at a time, maybe your printing cost is 3 or $4. So you can't always copy your competition. I think it's good to know where your competition is. But just price based on the form, whether it's a book or a booklet or an e-book. And then you can bundle it or unbundle it. I did a, a, a direct mail program to the parents of graduating college seniors. And I thought I, could, I did bundle two books and a video together and marketed these as a, as a package that the parents could buy it as a package at a lower price than purchasing all three books separately, all three products separately, and sold thousands of those to the parents. So you can charge extra fees for customization. We do this with our clients, with the corporate buyers. In many cases, we'll ask the author to autograph each book. <coughs> so if you have 500 books, that's pretty... <laughs> Yet we have to pay the author to do that, obviously. So we can charge for that for getting a, 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 a authentic auto autograph. Luxury brands, you can control the terms. If you can control the terms, I think it's better than controlling the price. Because if you can get them to uh, do, if you're charging interest, or if you get them to promote or to pay on a shorter basis, then you get the cash flow coming in. But just and use there are different discounting. Uh, techniques that you can use, and we can talk about those later if you want to hear more about it, but it's better to price it a little bit higher and then discount it where, uh, where and when necessary. A promotional portfolio, you know, this is, people will talk about just doing social marketing or uh, publicity, media, media appearances. I think it's more important to look at it in a quadrant here, a, a matrix, that some exposure, some publicity or promotion is for exposure, and some is for sales, and some has a short-term impact, some has a long-term impact. So you really need to look at your promotion as something. If you're looking for a quick start in 2012, well, you're doing some more direct mail or some e email blasts, you're doing personal presentations and selling at the back of the room. I think Judith has a record for selling like fifteen thousand dollars or something in a couple hours of, of back of the room sales. So it's something that you can make a lot of money doing that. Telephone, using the telephone to call people to whether it's setting appointments or actually making the sale. That you can do the short term sales action. So my point here, not to belabor it, is just that look at promotion based on its function, based on its capability, and don't expect something to do what it's not designed to do. So get the exposure and then get the sales, and then just know when to use each one. Max, and this is something people say, I don't have the money to promote. Well, this, they'll look at it this way. If you have 10000 in your budget, and then you have a promotional expense, you say you spend 5000 in promotion, and you only have 5000 left. Well, that's not the right way to look at it. Look at it this way, in that if you have the spend the 5000 but you obviously want to make more money then you would spend, so you have 6,000 coming in. These are just numbers. But the, the point is that you want to use your promotion as a catalyst to generate enough money that you exceed the amount of the investment. So look at promotion as that ROPI, the return on your promotional investment, and do those things that have a greater likelihood of returning. Media appearances is something we'll be uh, talking about this on, on January 21st. Actually, Judith is really well versed in media training, as I am I. So we'll do some mock interviews there. But there are two parts of, of media appearances: how to get on the air and then perform on the air. If you don't get on, obviously you can't perform. If you, but you can get on and, per, and not perform properly, and you don't sell any books. I found this website to be very 
productive as far as getting radio shows. You can go there and sort by uh, by format, by state, by zip code, by topic, and and find out those places in which you can contact, and then perform to the preparation content and deliver it. Sales promotion topics. These are a little bit more long term. So if you're looking to get a, a fast start, these are some things you may want to do: a sweepstakes or a contest early in the year. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, and then sending out some pa uh, postcards or that might have some more of a mid mid year return. But these counter displays are something you can, if you're doing a lot of retail marketing, a lot of retail selling, go to I guess bookdisplays. Dot com, which is uh, city die cutting, that they have stock and they have custom floor displays and, and counter displays for you. Personal presentations, these can do very good as far as exposure and for sales. If you set it up so you speak at, at, a, at an event, at an association meeting, for example, and then have someone work with you in the back of the room to sell your books while you're autographing those. And in doing webinars and teleseminars and, and regular seminars and doing trade shows, go to a website called Biz Trade Shows, B I Z Trade Shows.com. And you come up with, they're, they're starting now. And you can go to these and either walk the floor or actually exhibit there. But there are a lot of opportunities for personal events that you can could use. Internet marketing, very these are something that can be very immediate. If you have a good website or you're doing a lot of blogging or doing podcasts, or I have this e-zine, which has been very helpful to me to, uh, and to my, the, the people who contribute to it. It's not just my e-zine. It's Judith contributes to it, Dan Pointer, John Kramer, Guy Oxen. Uh, just a lot of different people provide their perspective on their area of expertise. But there are online bookstores, social commerce versus social networking. People talk about the social networking to build up their 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 platform. Well, it's better to look at it for social commerce, where you're using the intermediary, the, the messengers, to spread that word of mouth to your uh, your mobs <laughs> and getting them to uh, to to give you the credibility that they have based on their 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 subtopic. So the idea is that. Commerce is where you're selling product, and social networking is you just you just communicating. But use the internet for that. So that is, uh, <coughs> excuse me again, I apologize. As Judith mentioned, we in December 21st, uh, sorry, Denver in January 21st, uh, at the uh, Author U Winter Book Camp, I'll be speaking there and covering a lot of different topics. If you've seen me speak in the past, whether at the event that Judith and I and Dan Pointer did out in Denver a couple of years ago, or even the webinars that I've done recently, or I was at St. Louis and uh, Florida recently speaking there. If you saw any of those, this will be a lot different. Uh, new topics, new information, updated information. So we're looking a lot about ways to, uh, when you leave this event, you'll have a custom plan. I actually have a nine-page handout <laughs> that you'll have. You can fill in the blanks as we're going along. So that is a just a, a brief plug for that. And we'll talk a little bit about that towards the end of this webinar just to give you some more information. So Judith, we can open it up now to any questions that anybody may have that I can answer. We can, and let's see, I'm going to go with the very first one since Elga Ann was in first. And she has a book on spirituality. And there's always a challenge, I think, Brian, on marketing. I mean, every book has its own little niche where you market it toward. So she was looking for some ideas on marketing her new, it's, it, well, it would be in the body, mind, spirit, in the New Age area and how to get to some of these hidden audiences um, that are very different from the traditional venues. Sure. We have uh, several uh, spiritual type topics that we're marketing now. And it's, it's, uh, it's more difficult, but it certainly is very doable. Mm -hmm. The thing is to start out defining a target reader. Who is that person? And, and, and find out where they shop and so forth, and, and setting up in, into target segments. We have that for the titles we're looking at now. Uh, certainly have spiritual and, and new age bookstores, but we found a lot of opportunities for spiritual topics in uh, in retreats and, and even in, in the corporate setting. We have a uh, a corporate library. It's a virtual library we set up for a corporation, and they will announce these books to their employees every month. And the, the books are non business books. They're they're trying to get the a balanced employee. Mm -hmm. So maybe a book on on spirituality, on how to get a college tuition loan, or how to uh, 
deal with a, a breakup of a, of a marriage or, or a relationship. So these titles are, are, are really good for that opportunity. If it has a religious connotation to it, if it's uh, then it opens up a lot more areas. But if you think if you if you divide it into two sections, one is retail, one is non-retail. You have the retail opportunities, the new age bookstores, the spiritual bookstores, and you can sort these on uh, or search these online. One site I do recommend as a search engine is called Copernic, C-O-P-E-R-N-I-C dot com. And what's good about that is that it searches all search engines. So you can designate which search engines you want that to search, Google, Yahoo, AOL, uh, whatever it may be. But the great part about this is that it, it, it eliminates duplicates. So you can do a search on Google for spiritual bookstores and get 6 million hits. You can do a search for spiritual bookstores on Copernic and get 100 hits. And one of those may be a directory of bookstores. So if you can find out, if you have these opportunities of, of, of counsel, counseling associations, for example, we, we sell spiritual titles or, uh, to a, a certain association of counselors. And they may use those in, in, in different ways. And they'll, they may use your book as a premium for increasing membership. Because an association wants to, their objective is to maximize their, uh, their membership. So if you give a, a, free, a copy of your book to those who renew their membership or those who um, join for the first time, they get a free copy of your book. Or those as a, might be an early bird special for their quarterly or their annual conference if they give a, a copy of your book. So if you can find out these people who can use your, your content and how it, it, it will impact them and then find out what are those, where are those places in which you can reach them, I think that you'll find a lot of opportunities in retail and non-retail for retreats, for counselors, for co even the corporate setting for the spiritual topics. Okay. And then, um, Brian, would you repeat the website again for Copernic to spell Copernic. it out? So, C -O P O R N I C C O P E R N I C. I'm sorry, C O P E R N I C as in Charlie. dot com. Right. And, and I know Elva Ann Wells. I mean, she's quite she's quite good at sales. And so get her in front of a crowd. And I'm going to add on that one of her crowds, and I don't know how much she penetrates that, but I think that if she will look around in the healthcare arena, um, a lot of the hospitals through either the Women's and Children's Services or the PR do women's nights out or their health day or whatever. And sometimes they're looking for they're looking for speakers all the time. But they're looking for some balances that you can bring in. And her dealing with um, the where she speaks about uh, the wisdom of the ancients, for example, that might be a seductive enough title that they might be open to look at that. And, and I know you can sell a ton of books, which is going to open up my next question. And I think I'll jump on this, and then, Brian, I'm going to let you sure. jump on me in the response. It's from Rich. And, um, and why don't you, if, if anyone has their hand held up, then Brian can go to them next, too, and maybe we can bring your voice online. But Rich asks, uh, what selling books at, when selling books at an event, do you sell for cash only? And I'm going to tell you the answer is no. Um, uh, I've been selling books for over 25 years at events where it used to be heavy, heavy cash. In Las Vegas, I took chips, but I had to limit it to the hotel that we were in because you don't want to run around all over Timbuktu. But you're seeing so much less cash, and you're seeing um, where it used to be that we would take checks and where you worry about bounce check issue. The only places that I had problems with bounce checks were California re um, uh, situations and if I was in Florida. Otherwise, Midwest was golden. South and North Dakota, golden, never an issue. Now you see so few checks. It's credit card, credit card, credit card. And if you do not take credit cards, you're going to be in deep doo-doo when it comes to sales. You will miss out on so many. So um, I, you know, I have a little machine I carry around with me that I swipe on board. But with the ability, uh, if you can go to Intuit, and they have a fairly quick process that they'll send you, you know, the little square that you put into a smartphone, and you can swipe a card, um, and, and and it'll go directly into the bank account, and it authorizes the Wi-Fi, it authorizes it on site. Certainly, the the square has it. There's a variety of out there, but what do you want? To, the, the pain in the tush on some of them is that they require you to put in the address of the buyer. 
it's a pain. What you want to do if you swipe the card, my God, it's all there. And they want to make sure that the magnetic reader will pick it all up. So all you have to do is put into the, the price of what it is that they're buying. It gets authorized immediately. And what you can say to the person, because you're not going to be printing out a receipt, a lot of people, especially women buyers, want those receipts, I've, I've found, is that you can email them the receipt so they have it there. And what you might want to tell them if you have a, if it's going into an account that has a different name than your name or the name of your book, so they, cause sometimes they forget things between the time they buy and they get home or they see the card, um, is that make sure that you tell them that what they will see on their, their uh, statement, whether it's a debit card or a regular credit card statement, where it comes from. And that will save you a lot. And Rich, the sooner you get this online and get you going, the better it will be for you and your sales. All right? So asked, anything you want to add on to that? He asked where to get the swiper. I think he said Intuit. But I just started using the, the square that you just mentioned. Mm -hmm. it's right, I have a droid. And it, it fits in there. It's a, it, they charge 2.75%, which is less than my standard merchant account. But you're, you're right about the, the fact that I've been to, to, to these, uh, to many events where I'm trying to sell books, and, and people are, come up with a credit card, and I've had to manually write down the number. And people don't like doing that because then they're, they have another written record of their credit card number out there somewhere where they, they don't have any control over it. So it's much better to have some device like the, the Square that, that you mentioned that, and that I use and the Intuit or whatever it may be. But Rich asked where to get the swiper. So that's those are two places in which you can get it, but yeah, I and it's it. yeah, and it's free. Um, have that, but but usually they'll have. Now you know you're doing Wi-Fi. So one of the things that a lot of people get um, squirrely about is that. But now I have a monthly fee to have this option to do that. Well, check into it. You know, this is selling books, marketing books. There's a cost of doing this. And um, I know that for the way I operate, because I have this little handheld machine that covers three different accounts I'm operating at, one's for off of you, one's for my book business, one's for another consulting practice, that the, the reality is that I can code into each one just by pushing a button. So I carry that with me. But it costs me money. I mean, I have to spend, you know, for, for having to be on Wi-Fi every month. For me and how I operate with these three accounts, it's like $29. And then um, I actually pay less than Brian, so who do you, Brian? Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> but, but I'm paying around 1.5%. So, uh, Brian, you and I can have a discussion on where to go well, here. <laughs> we will. <laughs> and, um, that, but they all have charges to it. So you just need to figure out the bottom line. And let me tell you, there's a lot of hidden fees um, here and there. But you, should you take credit cards? Absolutely. There is no question about it. You're missing sales if you do not. Do you have to carry a slug of cash and pennies around? No, you don't. And my advice to you is that don't charge $29.95 or $20.95 or $14.95. You know, either you're going to keep the nickel or you're going to give them a nickel back um, with that. But make it easy for yourself. Make it easy so your transactions go in dollars. And, that, and you don't need to carry much cash with you these days. All right? Yeah, Richard asked the uh, the link to the swiper, and for the square, it's uh, square up squareup dot com, s q u a r e u p dot com. Mm -hmm. That's the one yeah, I and do check into it as well because they have a good deal going as well, check. Um, and they're looking for that. All right, another question that was sent in to me is is uh, where Brian in marketing because they all talk about social media and blogs is one of the key ways to go. Where do you find the right blogs? to subscribe to that are connected with your book. And so you become a voyeur, so to say, and, and then eventually post. Sure. Well, that, that's, first of all, just a step back. That, that's a very good strategy, is to instead of trying to create your own blog and keeping that up to date with regular postings on it, is to post on somebody else's blog. So if, if, particularly if you have one of these messengers that I mentioned before in, in your platform that has a large audience, well, blog on their site. Send them a copy of your book and they can they can talk about your book on, on their blog. So the idea is to make that as uh, do that as, as as often as possible. I, I there's a a blog on the book business magazine 
and they've asked me to blog on there on a regular basis, and that gets to a really good audience, well, for my audience of publishers. I reach a good level of publisher, and they ask me to speak at their annual event, and that they do it. They're, going to, they're doing an article on me, all based on the fact that I'm their, one of their three regular bloggers. So find, where do you find those people? Well, one is a, called blogtoplist.com, and the other is, uh, these are two examples. Technorati is one, Technorati, or blog top list. And in both of those, you can sort by the types of blogs. So you can come up with those, and, and as Judith mentioned, go boy, be a voyeur on, on those. Find out which those you feel most comfortable with, those that are more aligned with your content, and those that, that which you would feel comfortable comfortable participating on. Because when you when you're out there, you're getting exposure to a large group of people, and you, you want to have a message that's important to them. Otherwise, they'll just turn you off. But the, the, even a little bit more basic than than, than that is the fact that. I should have mentioned this before, actually, that you think you'll make more money when you stop selling your books. And that usually gets people's attention because what I mean by that is to sell your content. You're selling the information in your book. People want to buy information about how to, they, they, they want to get a job. They don't want to buy a book about how to get a job. They want information that will help them get a job quickly. And if, that, if they can get that in a blog, in a book, in an e-book, in, in an e-zine, that's what they want. But the idea is that you have to find you're promoting your content. You, you you want to become the, and and you are the expert in your field, in, in your topic. So the more blogging that you do, the more people that you, the more blogs in which you participate, and the more you get your name around, spread around based on your expertise and your content, the much more likely you are to, uh, to make sales and, and get and spread and build that platform. So just think about. Not so much the the format, but the content. Just, just one quick example of the, I had my job search book, a job search 101, that the one state government loved the book, but they did a lot of workshops and they wanted something that they could use in their workshop, and they wanted something that would lay flat. And a perfect bound book, as you know, doesn't lay flat easily. So I went to Staples. I cut off the binding. I had Staples put a spiral binding in it and brought it back to the state and it would lay flat. The same content, but it was in a different format. And because I did that, they placed a standing order of 8,000 books a quarter with that spiral binding on it. Went to other states and set up the same type of a program. So my point is, don't get hung up on on the format, on a, whether it's a book or an e-book or whatever. Ask the customers how they want that information delivered and provide it in that format. Mm -hmm. And also, um, if you're going to do that kind of customization, you might even say as a just line of, of a, a, a kudo, like when you're doing this, you did in your example, your spiral binding, um, that means that you're doing a special printing and that you say to them, you know, would you like to, or your VP of marketing or your CEO or fill in the blank, would you like to add a special letter or, or a, a, a charge to include to all the readers that are receiving that. It's a, it's a nice little touch, doesn't cost you X amount of dollars, and it makes you look like a hero. So we have a question. Kathy wants to know that uh, she said you mentioned techniques to get into novelty stores a few minutes ago. Can you expand on that just a little bit? Sure. The, uh, spread that, the, the topic out to gift uh, stores in general, that it, it's a great question. I think it's something if you can but first de define, it gets back to your target reader. You go back to the basics. My my reasoning for that is that if the the person who's going to go to a, a Hallmark store is much different than a person who's going to to purchase a book or a product at Spencer Gifts or Urban Outfitters. So go there first of all to find your your buyer, and then the go there is no really direct distributor or distribution outlet towards gift shops. But if the idea is, is that if you want to you go to gift marts, uh, go to gift trade shows, and there's a website called greatrep.com. And this site will, will help you or will tell you about the upcoming gift marts, upcoming trade shows. And it will also set up, you can set up a rep organization through, rep, uh, through Great Rep, just like the 
NAIPR site, the National Association of Independent Publishers Reps, you can set up your own rep groups to bookstores. Well, mm -hmm. you do the same thing with Great Rep, that they can, they can do that. There's also a group called IMRA, the Incentive Manufacturers uh, Representatives Alliance, IMRA. And you go there, and you, you can do the same thing. You can sort these people geographically. So you can sort the types of reps that might carry your, your, your book. Because not all these reps will, will carry the same type of book, same type of product. They, some may carry the spiritual topics. Other may, others may carry, carry more the novelty type books or humorous books. So the so one will be calling on Spencer and the other will be calling on Hallmark. But this at, at Great Rep or at IMRA, you can sort by the types of products that these reps carry and geographically where they go. So you can you can do that. There's also the uh, GCC.com, the um, Gift cat Creative Catalog, I think it is. What they do is put a catalog together of different products, and then they they sell this, this catalog to a gift shop. So the the, the, the catalog, the, the gift shop puts their name and their, their uh, contact information on this catalog. So you would go to GCC and get them to put your book in that catalog, and then they send it out to the, well, it's, they have an online version of it, and they also have the, uh, the printed version of it. So if you go to the, that's a way to get through a, a middleman, so to speak, of the GCC, I think it's gcc.com. But then they will get your book to them. But there is that's one of the, the few uh, opportunities that in retail it doesn't have a distribution, a formal distribution network. One thing I did was trying to get one of my clients' books into restoration hardware. And it's I wanted to get it in their catalog, not in the, the, the physical uh, stores. So what I did with the manager's approval, I went there, I took I put the book set up in different settings and took pictures of it, photographs of it, and then I got the the, uh, the Restoration Hardware catalog. I uh, actually placed this, this, glued this picture of this book in this setting in the catalog page in the section in which I thought it should go, and sent it to the catalog buyer. The, the, the buyer loved it because I did his job for him. In the sense, here's this book, it's a, here's the pricing for it, here's the quantity, uh, the case quantities. Here are, the, here are the promo that this author will be doing to support your catalog sales as well as your in-store sales. And here's how it here's how it would look in, in, in your catalog. And they loved it. So if you can, that's one way of, of, of doing it to get into their, uh, their their gift shop catalog. And uh, but start off with it with the definition of your target reader, so you know that. Okay. And <laughs> if, listen, um, make sure you put your questions in or. Put your hand up so Brian can go ahead and, and uh, open up the mic and come directly to you. All right, another question that came across, Brian, from Susie was, is advertising a waste of money? Or is there is there a difference between advertising and marketing? I mean, what's your two bits on that? Uh, it, it depends. <laughs> oh, okay. I, I think that advertising <laughs> can be very effective if it's, if it's niche-oriented. I took out the... There was a, a special magazine that went to all the college career development officers, mm -hmm. and it went out quarterly. I took the fourth page, the rear cover, and did a four-color ad in that. It was $700, $700 a quarter. And then I went to the quarterly uh, trade show that they had around the country, and I set up an exhibit there, a, a trade show booth, and I got a lot of exposure. People, I had the magazines there, first of all, and people said, yeah, I saw this book there. It's great. So I was able to sell books at, four, at list price, fourteen ninety five, non returnable, and more than cover the cost of the ad. So and they gave me a discount on the exhibit space because I was an ex, an advertiser. So I think if you advertise in a, in a niche opportunity, it can be very very productive. I don't recommend an advertisement in People magazine or even the New York uh, Times or a, a major newspaper in their book review section. That I think is a waste of time, waste of money. But another program that I work with my clients is to advertise to associations, or I should say through associations, in the sense that an association has a quarterly or monthly newsletter that they send to all their to all their members. So if you go to a website called Weddles, W-E-D-D-L-E-S dot com, you can sort the, all these associations by their their function. So you find those that are appropriate to your content. 
and then contact the newsletter editor and say that, that the newsletter editor can excerpt from your book and give some limits to how much they can excerpt each month and exchange that for advertising. So you get free advertising. So if you can barter advertising, it's free, then it's very, very accessible, then it's very productive. Uh, it's productive because it goes to your, your target market. It's productive because it's, uh, it's sent to them by a credible source. It comes from their, their association, and they will probably open up that newsletter because it's part of their membership dues to receive this newsletter. And there's your excerpt. On month one is an excerpt, and month two is an ad, and month three is an excerpt. And you can get that some great exposure. So that's why I said that it depends, <laughs> because it, it can be very productive. There's a, a, a formula that advertising agencies use. It's, called, it's, it's reach times frequency equals the gross media weight. But the, the key is to you want reach and frequency. Reach is to reach a, l a large number of people, but you have to reach a large number of people more frequently. So that's where your budget comes in. Do you reach people, uh, you reach a smaller number of people based on your segmentation. Remember, you, you set your, your target group up in these different market segments, so you, you can reach a smaller group more frequently. And you, if you can do that through advertising, it's just one, it's another hit, because people need to see information about your book seven to ten times, depending on which, which, which marketing article you read. And that may be a bumper sticker. It could be a, a radio show, a, a, a TV show, an article about a, a, a review. And then they get this ad from their association. It's, it just, it's another hit, it's, but it's a, it's a real credible hit because it gives you, it, it takes away that subjective advertising concept and gives it an objective advertising, it makes it an objective communication from that association. So it's almost like anything. I, I can answer almost any question. <laughs> it depends because there are varieties to it. But don't discount advertising just because people said it's a waste of money. It can be, but uh, and run the numbers. See what it costs you to run the ad. How many books do you have to sell in order to break even? And if it's worthwhile, then go ahead and do it. That $700 investment every quarter more than paid off. I got speaking engagements from that. I would go to the colleges and speak there. And they bought a minimum number of books for me to speak. And some paid for the expenses. Some paid an honorarium. So I got the a lot of benefits from running that one ad. So yeah, one of the things that you have to look at is is the barter trade off, and if it's in the right group, and if you're in, uh, I, I think that to going out, all our listeners who have books or are birthing books need to look in the niche area that they're at, and you go off to that association web website like Weddles.com, and you find out. So where are my associations that I go to? Find out their publications, and number one, I would be sending them if I have a book in hand, a review copy. Um, and ask them to review it because I'll tell you, guaranteed, there's going to be some meeting out there, whether it's a local group, a regional, whether it's a state group, even the national comes in, and your book might sing to them. I know that one of our listeners um, on this on this webinar is Gene, uh, uh, and he has a wonderful book out coming out called Leaders First. It is designed specifically for executives in the construction industry, and you're thinking, well, wait a minute, you know, construction is not doing so hot. Well, wait a minute, there's a lot of companies that are still in business out there. They're looking for strategic challenges. They're in challenges. They're looking for ways they can morph and ways they change. They still get together. They still have meetings. And that that would be the kind of thing that you specifically want to get out there in front of them. So it makes all the sense in the world um, for that to, to really look up where where you have. So we have a few more minutes left. And are there any more questions out there that some of you may have? Um, I don't see any hands up. I have I have one more uh, one more question that came in or actually I wanted to share something that, that's coming along and there there are some interesting stats and in, in your marketing and I'm going to encourage everyone to do it. But if you do not have or thought about creating a postcard that would go to whether it's to meeting planners for speaking, but a separate postcard that's designed specifically for uh, going to media for a show. And you design it so you have on that back side you know, a couple of uh, sassy, salty statements that will get their attention about your book. But leave some space in there that you can write it, because here's, here's the thing. People are so OD'd with all the emails. 
that they're getting, that you will get their attention with a postcard and get it in front of them. So don't forget the value of, of some of the traditional, just with a little morph, of using a snail mail approach. You get a roll of 29 cents stamps, 100 of them, and you start doing that target to get out there. And I know in the speaking field, I've had people tell me that they've held on to my cards for months and months and not trashing them and throwing them away because they were intrigued with the topic or they loved the book cover or who knows. But pay attention to that because you can take advantage of those things. And, and then let's see, one last question before we zip away. That Brian, you talk a lot about pricing strategies. Do, do, you, do you always stay set with a price or do you, do you diddle with them a little bit? You know, what, what's your take on that? Uh, it depends. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh yeah, I knew that was the answer. <laughs> well, there's the two things, two ways, several ways to look at that. First, there uh, retail versus non-retail. In retail, your book is right up next to other product in a bookstore. You're, you're right next to other books. And I was doing my, I had my job search books in, in Barnes and Noble and Borders, all the major stores. I was doing a lot of TV and radio shows. And I was directing people to go to these these stores looking for the my books. And there they were, right next to all the other books, and people had an immediate price comparison. So they see my book at fourteen ninety five. Here's one at twelve ninety five. Looks pretty good. I think I'll save two dollars and get that one. So on a, on, a, on the shelf, you have an, an immediate price comparison. You really, so you really have to be priced by by value. You've got to demonstrate the the incremental difference. If one's at fourteen ninety five and another's at twelve ninety five, how is your book four dollars or two dollars better? How do I get two dollars more value from that? So you're using, make sure that you, it's, it's that's value pricing. Then you have competitive pricing where you look, you're looking at the, uh, if you're going against a market leader, like the, the some book something about a parachute that in the job search area. I know, but don't tell me <laughs> what color is your parachute. Everybody said, you know, how's your book compare to that? So I really couldn't go higher than that book because I was. Um, that was the market leader in everybody's eyes. So what you need, what I needed to do was drop my cost because I wanted to make significant money. So a, a really important part of pricing is your cost structure. So if you can minimize your unit cost, you can maximize your profit. And what I did was it was a four-color cover, the black and white interior for this one book that I had. And uh, if I printed. 10,000 books, then the, the printing, the unit cost was, say, a dollar. If I printed five or 1,000 books, the, the unit cost was 250. Well, I couldn't afford the $10,000, and so I, but I wanted to get a good unit cost. So what I did, you know, what, what's the most expensive part of printing a book? Well, the, the cover. So I printed up 10,000 covers and then just did 2,000. The interior was all black and white, so I did 2,000 books at a time. So I'd really, I, I was able to be profitable at the same price because I couldn't impre increase my price over that 1495 because of the parachute book, but I was able to drop my cost. So I was actually, I don't know what his cost, cost structure was, but I knew I was making a dollar and a half more a book because I had this much better unit cost because I had the, the discount based on the 10,000 covers, so I dropped my unit cost to like 75 cents. Another benefit from that is that I had a lot of uh, covers that I could use for, for postcards because I, I could cut some of the covers down and use those as postcards. It was the one side was the book cover, and then I just printed on the other side. So th I really wanted to s uh, back up Judith's comment before about the, the validity of postcards, and that's w another way of getting it. But back to the price issue, when you're getting to the corporate sales, another reason why I said it depends, is that in corporate selling, there's a difference between price and cost, and, and which is still, well, even in, in retail it is too, but look at it in the corporate setting that the when you're contacting a buyer, they're not looking so much in, in what your your book costs them, what, what the price of your book is, because that's irrelevant. They're looking at how much will this cost me? If I can, if you have a book on pet care, how to take care of a dog, and I put this in my 20-pound bag of Purina dog chow, and I sell more of those. Say I, I spent ten thousand dollars on your book. I put a coupon for your book in your in this twenty pound bag of dog food, and I send it out when people buy that. Now, if if, if it cost me ten thousand dollars to buy your book, but I increase my twenty pound 
bag of my sale of 20 pound bags of dog food by $30,000, well, that's a, a really good investment. So they're looking at it from a cost perspective, not a price perspective. And the, in, in, in uh, negotiating a sale, your pricing is all based on quantity driven. In, in the trade, you get a, say, 50% discount to a bookstore regardless of the quantity. On book number one, it's 50%. On book number 1,000, uh, it's 50% or 10,000 is 50%. We're in a, in a, a negotiating sec, um, scenario. You may have it based uh, zero to 100 books at 10% discount. Uh, 101 to 500 is 20%. 501 to 1,000 is 30%. But the thing is, and that, now that gives you some negotiating uh, area that you can get the people to buy a larger quantity and get the better price, or you can, uh, with other uh, other negotiating, you can give them the higher uh, discounted price at a lower quantity, but the idea is that strategy or the pricing becomes a negotiating tool, and it's a variable. It's not in retail; it's fixed. In in the, in, uh, the corporate marketplace, it's a variable. So if you look at it that way, pricing is a is a is a real strategy. And, and you may there are two other pricing strategies. One is called penetration pricing, and one is called skimming pricing. And penetration pricing is it's a very low price. So you're trying to build share or build sales quickly. You're trying to get, get uh, move some outdated, not outdated, but a large inventory. Where skimming pricing is based on information that may be very uh, quickly outmoded, uh, or it may be if you have a, a digital printing, if you're using print on demand, then you have to go with a higher price. So there are a lot of variables to that. But the idea is that don't 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 just say, well, 14.95 sounds good. I'll, I'll use that. There are so many different pricing strategies or different considerations for the, 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 the price. And that probably depends on or will dictate your profitability more than almost anything else that you do. So pricing is a very critical marketing strategy. And, and consider it carefully before you do it. And if you, you can go with a higher price if you, uh, if you so desire. And then go with some more of the um, uh, discounting structures. You can offer a, a cash discount. Or you can offer quantity discounts. or uh, I have one client that had a, a, a book, the title was the, uh, the Career Guarantee, that if you did everything in, in this book and didn't get a job, then you, you can get a, a, a complete uh, refund on your $24.95. You can get geographic pricing or special event pricing or seasonal pricing. So if, if you're not sure, I would suggest going to a higher price, and then you can use these discount techniques to create a, a more palatable price that particular audience at that particular time of the year. So, All right, and then I, I have one more question, and then we'll we'll um, give them tell them what's going on here sure. for, the, for the end. But that libraries are always kind of that elusive thing. How do we get in without getting a rock your socks um, uh, review in the library journal? So, do you have a couple of ideas on that? I do, Judith. One is uh, I think what one client of mine did was created conducted a library tour. You can go to the ALA website and come up with the list of libraries in your state or your county. I live in Connecticut, so there are 162 libraries in here. And this client went to libraries, went to every library in, in over the course of what, three or four months, and sold 3,000 books. And he, he got paid for doing it. He, they paid his expenses, paid him an honorarium, and he got list price for the books, sold non-returnable, and sold 3,000 of them. So the, if you can create a library tour, I think that's where you really you can get into libraries. They, if they they may stock your book after that, or they may purchase one. But the idea is that you want to uh, you can get paid for doing it. They, you may they may give you that honorarium. So that that I think that's a great way of selling through libraries instead of selling to libraries because if the libraries they may purchase one copy of it, or a if you want to go to a a, a city like New York City or Denver or, or whatever. Uh, the LA or Dallas, whatever that the library association is for that 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 group, or they, they'll buy in large quantities. Is my my point that there are 80 libraries in the, in the New York City Library Association. So one contact there will yield 80 sales. So All right. when you let me ask you this: when you're t talking about tour, are you talking about physically going library to library? Or are we talking about doing like a Skype tour? Or uh, this is library to yeah. library. That, that's, a, that's a good point. It's, it's a physical tour. Uh, and that, you may be, maybe I'll, I wouldn't suggest it doing by Skype because the, the library wants to bring people in the, the, into their library. The, one of their objectives is to get people in the library. 
but it's, it is a physical tour. He went physically to each library. All right. So, no, I, I mean, I, I like this idea. So, I mean, I haven't heard anyone else talk about a library tour. So this is kind of cool. And so then what you would do, when you talk about covering expenses, so the, you mean the, the, the travel expenses, what expenses are they covering? You know, the library would give it an honorarium, say $50 plus expenses. But they, okay. might, they might pay him $100. And okay. he would always donate 10% back to the library. He would give them as a donation back to the library. The library does the promotion. They mm -hmm. talk among themselves, and, and, and he got a lot of the, he got calls from other libraries that invited them there, but they they'll usually pay something, and usually an honorarium and or cover your expenses. But the key is that it's all list price sales, non-returnable, mm -hmm. and and the library is doing a promotion. They're bringing people in. They may mm -hmm. have a series of of events set up so people are used to coming to the library. It, it's it, it worked for three thousand books in three months, and plus he got paid for it. So I think it's a good it's a good system. Yeah, and, and, you know, there's some great ideas in Colorado, and I think that we have people in other parts of the country who are listening in, but I know that we have, um, certainly in the metro area, uh, we've got something called Your Hub, which is a, it's, which is, it's online, as well as it's print once a week in the Denver Post, for example. And what you could do is you could literally strategic lay it out and go to that community, plus there are a lot of throwaway newspapers out there still. Yep. And you get that up there saying, I'm going to be in XYZ doing a special uh, program based on my book, Come On Down, folks. And I think that could be a very lovely, effective twist um, where the libraries will get their support in. They certainly have a little bit more conference space than your typical bookstore, actually. Oh, yeah, they really do. It's, it's, you know, and then you're, you're actually making direct sales. So you put more money in your pocket and you get it today. So, Rich... Um, I know you're still on, so if you want to. That's when you want your credit card that you can go through and you can process. Somebody did ask me to repeat that Great Rep website. It's it's great g r e a t r e p dot com. That's the, for the the novelty stores, gift shops. Great. Okay. Well, Brian, let's let's do a wrap up. I want to thank everyone for being there. Brian's going to be here in. Uh, it, it, I promise it won't be snowing on the 21st. Uh, you know, the, I, I 20th, can't. flying in the 20th. I don't want the snow then either. Yeah, well, that's, that's at least you'll be coming in the day before. Anyway, he'll be here the 21st. We're going to registrations at 8 o'clock. It will be at the Hilton Garden Inn. And, um, and we'll have a Continental breakfast. And then we will get going. Um, and we will be over at 3 -ish. So we'll have a really strong afternoon. There are going to be hot seats. And he's going to use a lot of strategies that we certainly included some that revealed, but we'll get into a lot more on how you can move your book, whether it's an old book or one that's just birthing on the 21st. And we were going to give anyone who, who hasn't signed up, well, actually, um, if you have signed up and you're going to be there, um, you'll get this too. But for people who sign up off of this webinar, what do we have for them? Well, a, I, a PDF copy of my book, Beyond the Bookstore, with the CD that goes along with it. So it's a $25 value. There you go. So all you, actually, it's a 45 That's what you used to sell it with, <laughs> with <the CD. laughs> when, when they were combined. With the hardcover, yeah, that's right. Yep, you did. And so um, all you have to do is when I see you sign up, then, um, because that comes to me, then I will notify Brian, and he will get you your, your goodies there. I will. All right, and so we'll look forward to seeing you on the 21st. Thank you, Brian. Everyone who's Welcome. in my neck of the woods, Colorado, stay warm. Roads are swift. <laughs> I will. Careful. You too. Wow. All right. Bye. All right, and then this will be up on recording for the AuthorU website, and we'll let you all know when it's available. Thanks, and good night. Good night.